Hey everybody, Mike Biamonte, uh, FBI School of Operational Medicine. Welcome. I uh, hope everybody's COVID free and feeling better. Uh, knock on wood, it seems like things are settling down a little bit. Hopefully that pattern continues. Let's continue on with, um, this is video 13 on this number, and we're going to continue on with cardiology. And what we're going to look at in this video is more cardiac disease. So what we did so far was we talked about cardiac A and P. We're going to talk about specific cardiac diseases in this video. In the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about specific cardiac diseases, but the assessment and treatment of those diseases. So it's sort of a three-part series. Beyond that, we may get more into, uh, again, ACLS review for our ALS providers, uh, 12 lead perhaps. Uh, we'll get more into the weeds on that later. Some administrative stuff. Some sad, sad news. Uh, Dealing with trained investigators, uh, somebody actually Googled the L.A. Coroner uh, gift shop and it closed in December of last year. Isn't that sad? It's terrible. Uh, a little moment of silence for the uh, L.A. Coroner's office uh, gift shop. That's awful. Uh, on that same note, Sacramento SWAT. Uh, one of the first classes we ever did at the schoolhouse was with Sacramento. So a little, little shout out to Sacramento, California and the boys and girls out there. Let's see. I put a uh, EMS abbreviations card or acronym card on the SharePoint site. So if my FBI folk, uh, this is courtesy of Special Agent Silverstein, Alex Silverstein, down in the Jacksonville field office. He put it together. Really nice little cheat sheet. Uh, so if my FBI folk go ahead to the SharePoint site and you can download that, laminate it, uh, keep it with the field guide that I've already posted. It's a, a good Good resource. What else? What else? What else? Uh, I think that's it on the admin side. Nothing sensitive, nothing classified. Let's get into it. Let's talk about uh, cardiac diseases. Now, again, the disclaimer, I am not a cardiologist. Never claimed to be, never will be. Uh, way too much school for me. Um, but what we're going to talk about is at the paramedic level, cardiac diseases... Uh, in general, uh, so let's talk about risk factors first. But uh, of course, uh, before we get into that, we have to we have to talk about heart attack. Peter, you threw the cook off for me. I couldn't take your dream away. Heart attack from your buddy. You ordered mini stroke. One with the real heart attack talent. You heart attack deserve the show. Regular stroke, not me. Again, I'm a big idiot. What can I tell you? I love it. Uh, we're not going to talk about strokes in this. Uh, segment, but we're going to talk about cardiac disease, heart attacks in general. And when we get into um, assessment of cardiac patient, we're going to see that people present differently. It's, it's never, I shouldn't say never, never say never, um, but y you're never going to see, or you very rarely, how about that, going to see the stereotypical uh, chest pain, difficulty breathing, nausea, sense of impending doom, radiating down the left arm. So we'll get into that later. So let's talk about risk factors first. And let me go ahead and put this slide up. And what we're looking at here is just what we call modifiable, non-modifiable risk factors. Um, what is it that causes heart disease? Is it genetic? Does it, you know, do we get it whether we want it or not based on our heritage? Uh, yeah, that, that's a variable. But when we look at modifiable risk factors, it talks about lipid levels. Okay, a lot of that is diet. What do you eat? Uh, what is your day-to-day -day diet? Do you have high blood pressure? Is it the type of high blood pressure that's hereditary and very difficult to control? Or is it your lifestyle? Is it your weight, uh, smoking, tobacco usage, uh, your lifestyle, obesity, diabetes, uh, diet, again, and even diabetes, that could be hereditary. That may not be a modifiable risk factor, but there are some things that we know in our heart that we can control to a certain degree versus non-modifiable. All right, age, you, know, you can't stop father time. That's ticking away. Uh, gender, don't even get me started on that topic as to how you, anyway, gender. Uh, you a little boy or a little girl, okay? Ethnicity, family history, Genetics, menopause, um, all of these are your non-modifiable risk factors. Some things you just cannot 
the biology. You cannot change. It is just the way it is. So I'll I'll kind of leave that one alone. Uh, that's a that's a that's a, a hot topic. Um, so let me pull this slide down. And what we'll talk a little bit more now about is the the root of the problem when we talk about cardiac disease, atherosclerotic heart disease, uh, AS, uh, HD, how it's abbreviated, hardening of the arteries, uh, plaque buildup, uh, calcium deposits, whatever it is you want to call it. Uh, if and when you ever get the chance to attend a, a gross anatomy lab, and maybe you have a uh, a cadaver lying in front of you that died from heart disease, and maybe even they didn't die from heart disease, who knows. But there are certain cadavers where if you get the, the heart in your hand, you can find those coronary arteries, and you can feel the coronary arteries on that epicardial uh, layer, like we talked about in the last video, and you'll feel the hard, hard, calcified coronary arteries. It really is pretty remarkable if you ever get your fingers on it and feel it. Uh, it gives you an idea of how these calcified and how this atherosclerotic heart disease plaque buildup really affects your, your vessel, uh, I don't wanna say integrity, but uh, the, the functionality of, of your vessels. It's pretty remarkable, and not just in your coronary arteries either. It could be really any artery in your body. So when we look at uh, this slide here, what we're looking at is a cross-section of plaque Build up in the tunica intima, all right, in that inner lining of any blood vessel. This could be any blood vessel USA, artery specifically, that we're talking about here. Uh, but here we want to really focus on those coronary arteries. So the way I think about it is a clean, slick, smooth coronary artery is, knock on wood, any kid USA. All right, kids are happy, healthy, juice boxes, you know, snackables, whatever it is they're eating, um, they should have pretty clean, slick coronary arteries. Well, over time, uh, the chicken nuggets, the chicken strips, the fried food, the pizza, the hamburgers, the, well, then you get older and, you know, Mr. Jack Daniels comes into your life and, uh, you know, happy hour and potato skins. And, and over time, this is just a, a timeline here that you're looking at of, atherosclerotic plaque buildup over time. And uh, I'll go for one more uh, quick video, or not video, I'm sorry, one more slide here. This just gives you a timeline. It talks about from on the right border there in green, uh, it says from first decade to third decade to fourth decade, um, my fifth decade now. So I know in my heart, pardon the pun, I have some of this going on somewhere. And it's in my family history. Uh, both of my grandfathers died in their 70s from cardiac disease. Knock on wood, my father is creeping up on 80 and he's doing great. Uh, hopefully he stays that way for a long time. But it's, a lot of it's genetics, like we talked about, and your non-modifiable risk factors. But over time, that tunica intima is going to have that collection of gruel, as it's called, or this plaque buildup. Um, and it will narrow the lumen or the inner diameter of that coronary artery and restrict blood flow to where over time you're going to need either cabbage coronary artery bypass graft or balloon angio cath with a stent. And we'll talk more about that in the next video. But notice on the very bottom of that slide, it looks like the capsule of that plaque has cracked, almost like a popped pimple. I know, disgusting, but that's just the, the way of looking at it. And here's where we run into problems. Uh, as blood courses over a smooth plaque deposit, the blood in the body doesn't experience turbulent blood flow. That blood flow is still pretty smooth. And when we get into assessment next week, we'll talk about how patients will present differently based on the plaque buildup. But as long as the blood is flowing smoothly over that capsule, over that plaque, it doesn't send out any chemical mediators to suggest to the body that there's a problem. But now once we have this crack, and again, try to imagine an abscess or a boil or a big pimple, over time it's gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually it's gonna pop. In this instance, it cracks. Now this crack, this rough edge on that actual uh, capsule for that plaque creates turbulent blood flow. Now, once the body senses turbulent blood flow, it becomes somewhat self-defeating. And what I mean by that is if we cut our finger 
Well, the body senses turbulent blood flow in that area, and it sends white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, plasma, everything to that area to help with the clotting cascade. Well, that's in an exterior wound, no harm, no foul. We clot and life is good. The body doesn't differentiate from an external hemorrhage to an internal, quote unquote, hemorrhage or turbulent blood flow. So now if we have that turbulent blood flow in that narrow, narrow coronary artery, what ends up happening is Mother Nature does the same thing. She sends all of these chemical mediators and all of these factors to that area and it starts to clot. Well, that's not good <laughs> because as that clot builds, what does it do? It completely occludes that coronary artery. And then we go from ischemia to injury to infarction. And we'll see a slide on this here in just a little bit. And then we start going into actual heart attacks. So as far as treatment goes, and we'll talk about that next slide, we come along and give aspirin, acetosilic acid. And what that's going to do is that's going to coat platelets and prevent the clot from getting any larger. And again, we'll go into that in more detail later on. So let's go ahead and pull the slide down. And I'm going to take a little, this is a, Again, water, by the way. My wife got me this cup a while ago. I drink and I know things. Uh, if any of you are uh, Game of Thrones fans, you understand the joke, but this is just juice. Nothing bad there. As a matter of fact, I've got a, a video happy hour with a dear, dear friend of mine from New York uh, later on today. I'm pretty excited about that. I might have one, two, 15. It depends. Depends on how the, how the happy hour goes. So, again, modifiable risk factor. Mm, all right. With that plaque buildup, we don't know that's going on. Again, I can have it going on right now. Uh, any of us can have it going on right now. Um, but it's one of those things where it doesn't really rear its ugly head until it rears its ugly head. And that's usually when you know about it. So what kind of, I don't want to say signs and symptoms are we going to see, because I'll get into the next video, but what type of patterns is heart tissue going through, right? From injury to ischemia to, to infarction to necrosis, what are we experiencing at the myocardial level? All right, back to pathophysiology. We've already talked about aerobic, anaerobic metabolism, lactic acid production. Uh, it's all, it all goes back to that. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I block off that coronary artery and now I have no blood flow distal to that occlusion, Anything past that point of blockade is ischemic now, or it's going through anaerobic metabolism, lactic acid production. And that's what gives people the uh, this sense of heaviness, pressure, tightness uh, in their chest is that lactic acid production. So what we have to do is try to reverse that. And again, that's the video for next week. So let me show you this slide here. And for the ALS folk in the room, this is pulling a little bit of the curtain back into 12 lead EKGs as to what you might see, whether you're seeing um, ST segment depressions, T wave, uh, canon T or enlarged T waves or hyperacute T waves, uh, these types of things, ST segment elevation depressions. We'll get more into that later on. But for now, let's just go with terminology. Initially, and this is sort of out of order, um, your Myocardial tissue starts to suffer from ischemia, uh, which is just a lack of oxygen. Eventually, that ischemic event, if not treated and reversed, will turn into an injury event. And again, it's a matter of semantics. The words really don't matter. Uh, but here's where your patient starts to become symptomatic in the ischemia and injury event. Well, now, if that goes uncorrected, or now we have a complete coronary artery occlusion as the progression of that clot increases, well, now we can start to slip into infarction. Now we have the beginnings of tissue death in infarction. And in the 12-lead world, we start to look at ST segment elevations now, and now it becomes a bit more uh, urgent. All the way to the point where if you don't fix the infarction, well, now we go to necrosis, and we have actual tissue death. And here is where the pain, pressure, squeezing, heaviness in that person's chest goes away, <laughs> because now the tissue is dead, so there's nothing, doesn't feel anything anymore. So later, uh, in a couple of slides from now, we're going to see the difference between what we call an endocardial wall MI to a transmural MI. So try to imagine these different stages from ischemia to injury to infarction to necrosis 
all taking place simultaneously, but at different layers throughout the myocardial tissue. And depending on where it occurs in the heart, will really kind of dictate uh, how that patient's going to fare. Uh, is this going to kill them? Or is this just going to, uh, I don't want to say cripple them, that's not the right way to say it, but make them uh, cardiac patients to where they have long-standing effect in the cardiac world from their, from their, uh, from their event. So let's pull the slide down. So a matter of semantics, I see this or I hear this confused all the time. Somebody having a heart attack versus somebody in cardiac arrest. Two different things altogether. Now, do you have to have a heart attack to go into cardiac arrest? And the answer is truly no, you don't. Uh, there's uh, some subtle variables in there that we're going to discuss that could lead you down the path of going into cardiac arrest without actually having a heart attack. Those are more rare. Uh, more infrequent than what you would normally see. What you normally see is that patient with long-standing cardiac disease, the modifiable, non-modifiable risk factors. <clears throat> uh, those are the ones that typically succumb to their disease and go into cardiac arrest. So usually your cardiac arrests are medical in nature uh, based on a long-standing history of cardiac disease. So let me check my notes, make sure we're in the, the right area here. Okay. Let's start talking about different, um, uh, different, uh, I don't want to say, different conditions, angina or angina. You say tomato, I say tomato, <clears throat> however you want to pronounce it. So let me go ahead and throw this slide up. Angina. Angina technically means squeezing feeling or pressure, uh, depending on how you want to actually define it. So if we have angina pectoris, the pectoral muscles, we have chest pain or chest tightness. You can have renal angina to where you can have this pain in your kidneys. So angina is just a term to mean pain or squeezing. Uh, that's really all it means. But we can have stable angina, unstable angina, and what we call variant angina or Prinz Menzel's angina. And here's that condition that I mentioned before of how you could not have or not have, you may not have any cardiac disease per se, but still going to cardiac arrest. And I'll give you an example of, let's say somebody in their twenties, uh, early thirties, whatever their age is, who knows. And I've treated a number of these patients in my, in my career. Um, from a cardiovascular standpoint, they're rock solid, nothing wrong with them. They're fit as a fiddle, they're in great shape, but maybe they're big into cocaine as an example. Uh, and I'll just use that as an example. doesn't mean that if somebody has Prenzmenzel's angina that they are doing cocaine. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm just letting you know what I've seen in the past. Somebody's got some heavy stimulant use. How about that? What they can suffer from is coronary artery spasm or Prinz Menzel's angina. There's no occlusion, there's no plaque buildup, but this overstimulation of the cardiovascular system can actually cause your coronary arteries to spasm down tight. And as far as the heart's concerned, well, they, it's, it's now has less oxygen. Uh, so it's, it's not gonna do very well. So depending on how long this Prinz Menzel's angina goes on, this could put your patient into cardiac arrest. Uh, there's actually a technical term for it. It's called cocaine-induced coronary artery spasm. So for my ALS providers in the room, if you have a patient who's suffering from cocaine-induced coronary artery spasm, nitrates may work. So your nitroglycerin may work. Uh, but chances are they need a benzo. They need Valium or Versed. Because you got to reduce that, that stimulant effect, that catecholamine release. Uh, and you got to calm them down, essentially. So back to the slide. You see your normal coronary artery there up on top, okay? Uh, the inner lumen of that coronary artery is smooth, slick, uh, the way it's supposed to be. Well, with stable angina, we have a plaque buildup. It's there. But there's still enough oxygenated blood getting past that obstruction to where it's not a factor. Where it becomes a factor is in activity. So DOE, dyspnea on exertion, difficulty breathing on exertion. Here's somebody who, as long as they're sitting down quiet, everything is fine. You stand that person up. Let's use the winter months in Northern Hemisphere as an example. Uh, it's snowing. Here's where you see a lot of cardiac arrests, unfortunately, is throughout the summer months, spring months, whatever, uh, this guy, this girl, 
um, is sitting, not quiet, but they didn't have a very active, they don't have a very active life uh, when it comes to uh, getting out and being physical and exercising. Well, now they have to go shovel snow, which is a physical demand. Anybody who's ever shoveled snow knows that it's no fun. So now they're out there breaking their ass shoveling snow and they have a heart attack and their body can't handle it and they go into cardiac arrest and we find them face down in the snow. It happens all the time. Um, so they don't have to go into cardiac arrest. So here is somebody who's outside shoveling snow and now all of a sudden they have this pressure, this pain, this heaviness. They have to sit down. They call 911. But over time as they sit down, now the oxygen demand of the heart goes down and that experience that they're having, that chest pain, that heaviness goes away because the lactic acid that was being produced by the myocardium distal to that occlusion has now subsided and has gone away. So stable angina is exactly what it sounds like. You can exert yourself, be physical, have this discomfort, pain, pressure, squeezing. Once you sit down and you rest, it goes away. Or maybe you take a nitroglycerin, it goes away. If you have a pre-existing condition, you know it's there. That's stable angina. Unstable angina has a few different names to it. Uh, unstable angina could be called pre-infarction angina, uh, as an example. Um, with unstable angina, the clot is there. Sometimes it's also called, uh, I've heard it called flap angina, to where you may have a flap in that plaque buildup. And over time, that flap will open and completely occlude the coronary artery, giving your patient all the, you know, uh, corresponding signs and symptoms. But then when the pressure drops and the patient relaxes, the flap goes back down, almost like a one-way valve. And now blood passes again, and their signs and symptoms go away. Um, we're not here necessarily, we being pre-hospital EMS, we're not here to look at somebody and say, well, I think maybe you're having unstable angina versus an actual MI. No, that's not what we're here to do. If we have somebody who has chest pain, having the squeezing tightness, they're presenting like a heart attack, we're going to treat them like a heart attack. And I'm going to call it a heart attack until proven otherwise. Um, so I don't really like to get into the, into the semantics and the minutia of unstable angina versus an actual MI. As far as I'm concerned, they're the same thing. You'll see stable angina all the time. Uh, your mall walkers, I pick on those people all the time, but they're walking around, they get short of breath, they sit down, maybe they take a nitro, maybe they don't. The heaviness, the pressure, the tightness, the squeezing goes away. Well, and they get up and they go about their business again. That's the truest definition of stable angina. So let me change the slide here. And what this is gonna show is just one more uh, example of the different types of occlusions or the different progression that you may see. Um, you have that inner lining, that tunica intima, slowly but surely starts to get that plaque buildup. Over time, that plaque buildup gets worse. Now that plaque capsule cracks, you have turbulent blood flow, and now you've got a blood clot that completely occludes that coronary artery. And here's where bad things start to happen. When I say bad things start to happen, I mean, you start to have a heart attack. Doesn't mean you're in cardiac arrest, it just means you're having a heart attack. Now, depending on where this is occurring, in the ALS world, we look at anterior wall MIs, lateral wall MIs, inferior wall MIs, posterior wall MIs, right sided versus left, which we'll talk about. Um, it's, it depends on where the MI is. It depends on what coronary artery is occluded, how much of it is occluded, how proximal is the occlusion, how distal is the occlusion. There's a lot of variables. So if you look at this picture and you look at the uh, where it labels left coronary artery, it looks like it resides below the pulmonary trunk there. Um, if you have an occlusion way up high in that coronary artery, kind of where that uh, arrow is, is depicting, it's called a Widowmaker. That's bad, because what that's doing is that's occluding the entire coronary artery that supplies the left side of the heart. Uh, that'll drop somebody like a hammer. That's a bad, bad heart attack, to say the least. Um, or you can have a very distal um, right coronary artery occlusion, and that 
actually feeds the very inferior wall of the left ventricle. Now, I know I said right coronary artery and the left ventricle in the same sentence, but in about 85% of your population that walks around, the very, very far tip of the right coronary artery is what supplies the inferior wall of the left ventricle. So if I had my choice, uh, I was up at the pearly, uh, I shouldn't say up at the pearly gates, that would be after the fact, wouldn't it? Uh, let's say the big man himself came down, came down and, and looked at me and said, you know what, Mike, you know, you're an ass, I know you're an ass, you're a clown, but you're a good guy, you've tried to do well in this life, uh, sometimes you fail, but you, you, your heart is somewhat genuine. I'm going to give you a choice. Uh, you can either have an anterior wall MI, a lateral wall MI, or an inferior wall MI. Which one do you want? I'll take inferior every day and twice on Sunday. Not that it's a good MI, but it's the lesser of the three evils, if you will. So, uh, one other thing I want to point out on this slide is if you look at where the aorta is and where the pulmonary artery uh, comes up into the aorta, you see what looks like a little series of cobwebs connecting the aorta to the pulmonary trunk. Remember in the last video, I talked about uh, the ligamentum arteriosum, right, which uh, uh, was that in utero, used to be the ductus arteriosus, uh, used to be that in utero uh, blood vessel that I talked about. That's that structure. This is where it connects. So that is your ligamentum arteriosum, uh, if you want to refer back to the last video. So let me go ahead and pull the slide down. All right, so let's pause for a second. We've talked about modifiable, non-modifiable non risk factors. We've talked about atherosclerotic heart disease, plaque buildup, ischemia, injury, infarction, necrosis, uh, you know, what this occlusion starts to look like. Well, now remember in our last video, the coronary arteries just kind of skim along the epicardial surface and then they sort of dive down and penetrate the myocardium and they actually perfuse your myocardial tissue from the endocardium, to the myocardium, to the epicardium. So it perfuses from inside out. So when we start to talk about heart attacks, typically speaking, somebody will start to suffer from what's known as an endocardial wall MI first, and then it'll go to a, an MI until it goes all the way through the tissue. And then we have a full thickness MI or what's called a transmural MI. And that's when we get our different EKG changes at the ALS level. So when I put a 12 lead EKG on somebody, I'm looking for certain patterns and certain telltale morphology, certain shapes that's going to tell me, okay, this is an ischemic event. Okay, this is an infarction. And this infarction is getting bad because now I start to get this transmural MI. I get certain wave changes. And it gives me a sense of urgency. So, okay, this patient's sick and I need to get them to the appropriate facility being an interventional cath lab. Um, so let me go ahead and put this slide up here real quick. This is your uh, depiction of, let's say, your left ventricular wall. And just so you know, when we do a 12 lead EKG, all we're really looking at is the left ventricular wall. Now, there are other ways to look at the right side and you know, we'll talk about that in later videos. But really all we're concerned with at that specific point in time in the acute uh, cardiac care is a left ventricular wall, because that's the workhorse. So just try to imagine this picture here as a left ventricular wall. Don't, for the BLS providers in the room, don't necessarily look at the waveforms on the bottom. Uh, that's more for the ALS providers uh, doing 12 leads. But if you look at that as a cross section, you'll see the endocardial wall, the innermost lining of your heart, is what's affected first. And slowly but surely, it progresses outward toward the epicardium. That's when you go from your um, endocardial wall MI to your transmural wall MI. Uh, last video, we discussed heart tones and papillary muscles and chordae tendinae and mitral valve prolapse, which leads to heart murmurs. One of the earliest uh, signs that we're going to listen for in the advanced world would be a new onset heart murmur. Somebody has a new onset heart murmur could indicate new onset endocardial wall MI, which is affecting the papillary muscle, which affects the chordae tendinae, which affects that um, mitral valve or that bicuspid valve, which creates that regurge of blood, which creates the heart murmur. So 
that's a little glimpse into heart tones. But again, in the EMS world, it's very difficult for us to, to listen for this or really wrap our heads around it. So let me change the slide here and give you just one more example of what we're talking about. This is another picture, and I have to log back on here to my computer because it logged me off. There we go. Uh, this is another picture just indicating endocardial wall MI versus full thickness or transmural. So for my BLS personnel, don't worry about this. If it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, and talks like a duck, chances are it's a duck. If you think someone's having a heart attack, I don't care if they're having an endocardial wall MI, an MI, a transmural, I could care less. Treat them accordingly, and we'll get into that next video. Um, but for the ALS folk in the room, and when we're doing our 12 leads, uh, this is more of what we're looking for, is uh, how early or late in the heart, of it, heart attack or the acute coronary syndrome, uh, you know, from somebody with coronary artery disease, how far down the road are they? And that's what this is really going to show. So let me pull this down. All right. That's just a glimpse into what the heart muscle is going through and why they may be presenting the way they're presenting. And again, I hate to say, I hate to keep saying it, but in the next video, we're going to discuss uh, how patients present differently uh, based on where this MI may be occurring. So when we looked at the AMP of the heart, we took the heart and we divided it, right side versus left side. Uh, right side was a low pressure side. Uh, left side was the high pressure side. We are most concerned in the cardiac world, in the emergency cardiac world, we are most concerned with problems of the left ventricle because that's what's going to kill somebody the fastest. Am I saying that you're not going to die from a right side of the MI? No, I'm not saying that. But you have more of a chance of dying from a left side of the MI. So how do they present? How are, we, how are they different? Uh, so let me go ahead and, and check my notes and make sure I'm staying on track here. Okay, very good. Um, a good practitioner, uh, a good doctor, a good paramedic, whatever, uh, is going to be able to look at somebody pretty quickly and see if they're suffering from a left versus a right-sided MI, usually. So, but you need a good, a good physician. Holy shit. I'm honored, sir. I'm Dr. Nicholas. Nicholas Van Helsing, professor of proctology and other related tendencies, graduate of the University of Rangoon, and assorted night classes at the Knoxville, Tennessee College of Faith Healing. You may be a little overqualified for this job. You got your equipment with you? I never go anywhere without it. However, in my particular line of work, I seldom need more than this. <laughs> and a little, little blast from the past. I think that was an 80s movie. I'm not mistaken. Cannibal Run, that's a good one. Um, so how do we look at somebody and say, okay, they're having a left side of the MI versus a right side of the MI. Is it important to look and notice? Yeah, initially, when we get into the care and treatment of it later, uh, it is important. But think about the anatomy and physiology. If we have somebody, let's go with the lesser of two evils first. If we have somebody with a right-sided MI, uh, right-sided weakness. Remember in that anatomy and physiology video, we talked about the right ventricle being very thin, very floppy, because it doesn't have to pump very far. It only has to pump to the lungs. So if we have an affliction of the right ventricle, okay, what's going to happen? It may not pump as effectively or bring fluid in as effectively from your systemic, uh, you know, from everywhere else in your body. Where are we going to see that? Uh, we're going to see that more in the lower extremities. Gravity is going to take over. So if your body, if your right side of your body, right, right heart, can't receive this blood efficiently and push it to the lungs, well, it's going to start to settle in dependent areas. Feet, ankles, this is why you get pedal edema. You may have what's called hepatomegalia. You may have an enlarged liver. Uh, you may start to get JVD, uh, ascites. Ascites is a fluid accumulation. Um... In your, in your abdominal cavity, and you can actually take your fingers and go whoop, and push it in someone's belly and let go, and you'll see the little finger marks. Another way to check to see if somebody's having right-sided heart failure is if you lay them down flat and push on their liver, their EJs, their external jugulars, will, will pop up. 
Uh, that's uh, an indicator for an engorged liver. It's called a hepatojugular reflux, and they'll get a, a little... So for the ALS providers in the room, if you're ever looking to start an EJ on somebody in the acute setting and you're going to cannulate it, like starting an IV, um, lay your patient down, put their feet up, have somebody push on their liver, tamponade here, and you'll see a big, whether they have right side of heart failure or not, you'll see a big EJ come up, and you can stick that thing with a needle all day. Uh, so it's just one trick for cannulating an EJ in the emergency scenario. But if somebody has right-sided heart failure, typically you're going to see systemic edema, starting in the legs, more the dependent areas, feet, ankles, uh, abdominal area, um, and in your neck. Pure right-sided heart failure is called corpomonale. Uh, it's something you don't see very often, at least in the pre-hospital setting, you don't see it very often. Uh, but it is out there. It's actually called corpomonale. But the leading cause of right-sided heart failure is left-sided heart failure. Because now if the left side starts to fail, well, now you can't pull blood out of the lungs fast enough because the right side keeps pushing it in. So if the right side is doing just fine and the left side is failing, well, the right side could give a shit less what the left side is doing. The right side's going to keep on pushing blood into the lungs. But the left side, because you have left ventricular damage, the left side isn't strong enough to push that blood out. So where do these two meet is at the alveolar level, right? the capillary alveoli in the lungs. And remember, one cell thick for the alveoli and for the alveolar capillaries. If you have this high hydrostatic pressure, like we talked about in pathophysiology, you have this high hydrostatic pressure in the alveoli, well, water is non-compressible. It has to go somewhere. So it's going to get pushed out into the alveoli. This is when we start getting pulmonary edema or fluid in the lungs, and it's actually plasma. And a lot of your books, you'll see uh, or hear about pink frothy sputum for your pulmonary edema patients. Yeah, that's about right. Because what happens is the myoglobin, uh, the, 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 the unit that creates the, the, the coloration for the blood, um, some of that actually slips into your plasma. And now your yellow plasma meets up with this red uh pigment, if you want to call it that. It really isn't, but just follow me down this rabbit hole. Well, now you're breathing and you're aerosolizing it, and it mixes together, and yellow and red kind of make up a pinkish color, and as you aerosolize it, it becomes frothy, and they start to have this pink frothy sputum coming out of their nose, their mouth, and their... <sighs> and you'll see them. You, you'll hear them, again, in the back of a house when you walk in the front door. It's unmistakable, uh, the sound. And we'll get into the treatment and care for them and the assessment of them in a later, uh, in the next video. So let's look at this picture here. Just giving you a cartoon drawing of left-sided heart failure versus right-sided heart failure. Um, your left-sided heart failure is more your acute, okay, this patient's sick, and not doing very well, <coughs> pardon me, uh, kind of patient. Where your right-sided heart failure, uh, not to say they're not acute, not to say they're not dying, but they're far less complicated in the emergency world, in the EMS world. That's typically not going to kill someone right away, whereas your left-sided heart failure patient, yeah, that'll drop somebody quick. Now, let me go ahead and dispel a rumor. Uh, there's a rumor out there that if you give a left-sided heart failure patient albuterol, you're going to create flash pulmonary edema and kill them. Nope. Let me throw the bullshit flag. That is not true. You're going to hear medics say that. That is not true. What ends up happening in some of these patients, and this is a little peek behind the curtain for assessment. We'll talk about this again in the next video. When this fluid starts backing up into the lungs, what ends up happening is that fluid is an irritant to the bronchioles. So now these bronchioles will go into spasm. Now you have bronchial spasms, just like you have with asthma. So what you're hearing in some of these patients, although they're in distress and they're tripoding and they look like they're very, very sick, you're going to hear wheezing. We call this cardiac wheezes. You don't hear rails or rolls. We don't hear that bubbling in fluid in the, in the lung field when we listen to them. What we end up hearing is rails. So I'm sorry, what we end up hearing is wheezes. So what do we do to treat bronchospasm? Well, we give albuterol because they need it. So what ends up happening is we don't know they're in pulmonary edema. We just know they're wheezing. 
So we take an albuterol treatment, an atrovent treatment, combivent, whatever your protocol is, we stick it in their mouth, they start breathing away on it. Well, what happens is it stops the bronchial spasm, opens up those bronchioles. Now, what do you hear clear as day? You hear the gurgling, you hear the rails, and the wheezes go away. You did not cause the pulmonary edema. It was already there. You just couldn't hear it. Well, now you have to switch gears. And they say, oh, shit, okay. Now you pull that albuterol away from them because they don't need it anymore. You give them 100% oxygen. More specifically, you give them CPAP, and we'll get into that next video. And you start to treat them down your pulmonary edema road. So let me go ahead and say it again. I'll get on my soapbox. You did not cause that pulmonary edema. You're going to have ALS providers tell you that. That's horseshit. You did not. You just have to be a good heads-up paramedic and realize, okay, I've stopped the bronchospasm. I don't need the albuterol anymore because now your albuterol is also a beta-1 agonist. It's going to increase your heart rate. Chances are this person's having a heart attack. You don't want to increase their heart rate any more than it already is because it's already up there because chances are you're making your heart attack worse. So just good, good heads-up clinical skills. So for the BLS providers in the room, if you have a patient who is having extreme difficulty breathing, wheezing, if you hear these wheezes, there's no way for you to tell if this is a cardiac wheeze or an actual wheeze from asthma. They take their handheld meter dose inhaler, they take their nebulizer. Now all of a sudden they sound like they're drowning. Okay, let them stay in a position of comfort. They're going to tell you what that is, which is sitting straight up. Give them 100% oxygen and wait for ALS to arrive. And then we'll go down our road. So let me go ahead and pull this slide down. And kind of step away from right versus left side of heart failure for a second. Again, leading cause, <coughs> pardon me, corona. Mm. Leading cause of right side of heart failure is left. Because if we have that increased resistance in the lungs now, and the right side of the heart is trying to push fluid into this congested lung, well, it's putting a strain on the right ventricular wall, which is already very thin and not really built for that. So now that right wall is gonna get weakened. And now eventually, once the left side issue is treated, taken care of, resolves, whatever, now you're left with a weakened right and left side of the heart. And now you start to suffer from a condition known as uh, CHF, congestive heart failure. So this picture here just shows you, it really doesn't show you much, but it's just giving you an example of how over time in somebody who has some significant cardiac disease from left-sided MIs to right-sided effects because of left-sided problems, the heart can become actually a little enlarged. And although in the bodybuilding world, we think bigger muscles, stronger, more efficient, doesn't always work that way in the cardiac world. Just because the heart is bigger and stronger, or bigger doesn't mean it's stronger. So as an example, if uh, we have a left-sided MI, and it's a, a good MI, a big one, when, when I say good, I mean bad for the patient, but a, a decent size MI, what will end up happening is you can have left ventricular hypertrophy or left ventricular remodeling because now that damaged tissue starts to sort of heal and remodel and becomes more scar tissue and less pliable tissue. It doesn't beat as well. It doesn't beat as strong. So now we have a problem overall trying to uh, keep up with moving fluid from point A to point B. The heart is just weak. So now we have a weak pump. So if you have pumps in your house, pumps in your car, uh, basic hydraulics, if your pump is weak, you're not moving water efficiently. If you get significant damage from left-sided MIs, right-sided complications, well, now your heart isn't moving blood the way it should. These are CHFers, congestive heart failure. These are people who are, they have a hard time with everyday tasks. Walking around, they get winded. Uh, their feet are always getting swollen. Um, you know, you see the, 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 the elastic lines in their ankles from where their socks are digging into their ankle. They get cankles. Their calves go straight down into their ankles. You can't differentiate one from the other. Um, these are your cardiac patients who have significant cardiac problems. 
and they cannot be active. They have to move slowly. They move, you know, deliberately. Uh, these are your, and I hate to use the term, these tend to be more your cardiac cripples. Just because you have CHF doesn't mean you're a cardiac cripple, and I hate to use that term, but that's really a very, it paints a very vivid picture. Um, but these are people who are very limited on what they can do. They can't walk around all day. They've got to sit down. They've got to put their feet up because they got to reduce the swelling in their ankles because their heart just can't keep up. <clears throat> so let me talk about one more thing. Uh, let me pull this slide down. What we'll talk about uh, real quick is cardiogenic shock. Uh, cardiogenic shock, think shock with rails. These are sick, sick patients. In the EMS world, we don't usually see cardiogenic shock because what ends up happening is cardiogenic shock is a complete pump failure. Left and right side are starting to fail and you go into cardiac arrest. Uh, so they are having huge cardiac issues that puts them into cardiac arrest. About 85% of your patients who suffer from cardiogenic shock will die. That's just the way it is. So in EMS, what we tend to find when we roll up after 911 is called is we'll find a patient that's already in cardiac arrest. We don't know it's because of cardiogenic shock. We just know that they're in cardiac arrest. In my career, I can count on one hand, 32 years, I can count on one hand how many patients I've ever seen in true cardiogenic shock. They look sick. I mean, if there's a picture of somebody who's desperately trying to die on you, it is your patient in cardiogenic shock. So think somebody who looks shocky, cool, pale, diaphoretic, ashen, gray. They look awful, uh, but they're filling up with rails because the left side of the heart is really failing as well as the right side. But they're backing up with fluids. The heart just can't keep up and it is really failing. So the big difference, a lot of uh, pre-hospital care providers struggle with this. What's the difference between somebody in strict left-sided heart failure, okay, pulmonary edema, and cardiogenic shock. Biggest thing is presentation and blood pressure. Somebody in uh, pulmonary edema because of left-sided MI, yeah, they're going to look sweaty and nasty and pale and disgusting. Their pressure is going to be very high for this, from this pulmonary hypertension they're suffering from. Whereas somebody in cardiogenic shock is going to look like death. I mean, gray, they're going to look awful, filling up with rails, just like with left-sided MI, but their pressure's in the toilet. That's your big difference, right? Left-sided MI with pulmonary edema, it's going to be high blood pressure. Complete cardiac failure with pulmonary edema and low blood pressure, that's cardiogenic shock. Both are bad, but cardiogenic shock is going to kill you quicker than anything else. Okay, those are the things that uh, those are the main things we're into. There's, there's a ton of other things from aneurysms to pulmonary embolisms to, to pericardial tamponade to pericarditis. We can spend all day talking about these things. But these are the biggest things from angina to MI to atherosclerotic heart disease to, to left versus right sided heart failure to pulmonary edema. These are the main things we're going to see pre hospitally. And in the next video, we'll get more into treatment, all right? And we're going to recap. And you know, if you notice, I become very redundant in these things. And there's a, there's a method to my madness. That's what really makes it sink in. So if you apply everything we learned in A&P, everything we learned in pathophysiology and pharmacology, and now you see cardiac A&P again, we talk about these diseases. And in the next video, we're going to talk a little bit about A&P a little bit about the disease, but now we're going to get into the assessment and the treatment of these diseases. Then it's really going to start to sink in and uh, it makes sense. I hope. Hopefully I'm, I'm doing a good job at that. Let me check my notes and make sure we're all set here. I think we're good. Uh, that's it. All right. Okay, everybody. That's it for me. This is video 13 coming to a close. Have a great day, a great night. Stay COVID free. I'm going to enjoy happy hour tonight. I hope you do the same. That is all. Uh, take care. And again, thanks for watching.